Um, I think I know most of you by now. It's been two years as of next month, but I'm Josh Ginsberg. I'm the president of the Cary Institute, and I'd like to welcome you all to a Friday night with Cary. Uh, before I before I introduce our speaker, um, I want to do a couple things. First of which is I always like to tell you about upcoming events because I have capital audience. Um, on Sunday, September 11th, uh, the Cary Institute's Charlie Cannon will do his annual forest ecology walk. Um, and he's going to walk along the Wappinger Creek Trail on Cary property. For those of you who don't know, we have lots of trails. They're free. Come use them. They're open to the public. Um, and I highly urge uh, you guys to sign up early because they, these uh, walks are also by tonight free and they fill up very quickly. And Charlie does a wonderful almost historical ecology of the property. Uh, so it's lots of fun. Um, and then I'd like to tell you about our next two Friday nights. Um, on the 30th of September, so there's a bit of a break. It's early in August and late September. Um, Harry Green from Cornell is a professor at Cornell. is going to talk about a subject that's quite broad. Why we should care about nature. And I think Harry's very well qualified to do that because he cares about all sorts of nature. For sort of from snakes to large uh, African mammals and back again. Um, and it will be one of those talks that has a little bit of ethics and a little bit of ecology and should be both entertaining and interesting. Um, and then on Friday, October 21st, you'll understand we don't want to get too close to Halloween. Um, Dave Schrader, uh, who is a uh, now a Maris, uh, a faculty member of the Italian State. Dave retired in July, but we're going to ensure that he uh, remains deeply connected to the institution. Dave spent only the last 30 to 35 years working on freshwater ecology, particularly the Hudson River. He's an expert on uh, freshwater bivalves, particularly mussels. But uh, he's going to talk more broadly about what he calls our other blue climate. Um, because while uh, we know that 75% um, of the Earth is, is covered with oceans, 1% of the Earth is covered with freshwater, and that freshwater is rather important. Um, Dave is a wonderful speaker, and I urge you to come to that. Um, now, if you want to ensure, because as you can see, even on an August uh, Friday, we are more or less sold out, um, you'll notice that some people have name tags on the back of their seats. Uh, I have one because I work here. Um, <laughs> but also, I'm a member of the Alvin Leopold Society. The Alvin Leopold Society is, is our, uh, our most uh, favorite guests and friends. We have many friends and we like all of you. Uh, but if you donate to, this, uh, to the Cary Institute at a uh, higher level, you can uh, reserve seats for these lectures, and um, that means you'll always have a good seat. So if you're not an Alvin Leopold Society member, pick up a, a picture on that or come talk. All right, that's the preamble. It gives me tremendous pleasure uh, to introduce tonight's speaker, Deborah Kramer. Uh, Deborah lives on the edge of the salt marsh in Gloucester, Mass. <coughs> uh, I live in the old part of the Sharon Connecticut, so I can only get real jealous. Um, and you know, because of that, she has a phenomenal interest in, in the coastal zone and in the oceans and, uh, and conservation. Um, she's written uh, several books. Um, the first two were on oceans. Um, and I had that wonderful experience where I sit on the board of a group called the Ocean Foundation, and I wrote the directors and all friends as well. I said, so do you know Deborah Crickle? Because her first two books are on, on oceans. And he wrote back and said, <coughs> Mr. Treasurer, that would be me. Um, we were fiscal sponsor for uh, the book on red notes. And so I discovered something new about an institution that I'm part of. Unfortunately, that happened before I was on the board. Um, but so I, I feel that also uh, red knots and their migratory patterns are something I've been interested in. When I worked with the Wildlife Conservation Society, we uh, funded a man named Larry Niles, who you may talk about on his work, certainly the results of his work, and works in New Jersey on red knots. And red notes are a remarkable species. And, and Deborah has written a remarkable book. Um, as you can see, it's got one of those uh, little gold uh, labels on it, the Southern Environmental Law Center uh, it gave it its uh, natural history book of the year. I don't know if we have the red kind of uh, read award for environmental writing. Um, it is a wonderful essay. And you know, I think what's interesting, uh, without giving away the story, is that you can think about this as a book about a bird, or about a bird and a crab, but it's really a book about where we are in nature and in conservation right now. And it is uh, a wonderfully written book. There's a copies on sale outside afterwards from American Books and Partners. Uh, but I hope you enjoy the talk, um, because the research uh, 
is a broad metaphor, I think, for the challenges we face in the 21st century, uh, both optimistically for what we can do and uh, reality check on what we've been doing to, to make sure with whom we share this planet. So, Deborah, please welcome to our institute. Including the big one, 
that wiped out 97% of life in the sea. And lastly, an epic journey of all the people in this story. People whose dedication, country by country, year by year, season by season, and beach by beach, are repairing our torn world. You and the scientists at Cary may see yourselves in these people. Now this book is a book about a bird and a horseshoe crab, but as Josh said, it's about much more. It came to be about how we face the difficult choices that lie before us and how we carry ourselves in this world. It came to be about beauty, which still abides, about loss and resilience and renewal. Now, these are very lofty things, but there were a lot of challenges writing this book, and I'm not going to go through all of them this evening, but I will share one with you in this uh, slide. It was made by my young <laughs> The subject of subjects of my book cannot read. <laughs> and because they can't read and can't do a lot of other things, they don't have a seat at the regular, regulatory tables where their fates are decided. And what happens to them really matters. And that's why I chose to write about them, even though it immediately presented for my publisher a marketing nightmare. <laughs> now, I traveled for thousands of miles, um, partially thanks to the Ocean Foundation, to places I never imagined I'd be and may never see again, accompanying Red Knots on this extraordinary journey. Their story is now the story of millions of shorebirds in North America and across the world. So if you don't know this bird, I just wanted to start by showing you here, I'm not reading on the beach. But their journey actually begins down here in their winter quarters in Vialomas, a vast windswept beach along the Strait of Magellan. The empty beach extends for mile after mile, broken only by the occasional guanaco leaping the fencing from the upland Estancias. The tidal flats here are four miles wide. So at low tide, the mud reaches beyond the horizon. This is the only place in the world where I stood at the edge of the sea and been unable to see the water. And the birds come in with the tide. And from a distance, they look like tiny wisps of smoke. And then the smoke materializes into these large flocks sailing over the mud flats. And then the water rushes in like this. And this is what they look like. Now, you can't see us in this picture, but we're standing in this flock of knots and godwits, the largest concentration of knots and what is possibly their last remaining home on Cherry del Fuego. Their numbers have been dropping here. At this point, I like to think about their journey to the Arctic as being like climbing a ladder, where now every run is necessary and broken ones along the way can jeopardize the entire trip. But the nice thing about the latter analogy is that it can be repaired um, by run. And I'm going to show you some other clips on the latter this evening, but also a few of the people repairing it. And uh, although uh, Larry's work is implicitly discussed here, um, and I have some amazingly embarrassing pictures of him, I, um, I decided to focus instead this evening on the, on the people from South America. So here's the first one, Carmen Espose. She's dean of the Faculty of Sciences at the University of Santo Tomas in Santiago. But this is where she feels most at home, on the beach in Bailamas, where she works all day, which in the summer is all night, in the blustery wind, which is often blowing at hurricane strength, following the birds in and out with the tide, figuring out what they're eating, how the abundance of their food is changing and why their numbers are dropping. Terra del Fuego is a difficult place. Um, you can read about it in the book. I was trying to figure out a short way of describing this to you here. Um, 
missionaries called it the uttermost part of the earth. And Magellan fought the winds and treacherous tides here and was repeatedly blown back to sea from these beaches. And it was so awful that his men mutinied. And this took place in October. And while he was hanging his mutant sailors and couldn't wait to get out of there, the birds were arriving and they were going to stay for five months. Now, these birds are really versatile. So from this remote, isolated place, um, they can fly 500 miles north here. This is Las Brutas, Argentina, a very different place. Um, it's black in here. I took this picture very early in the morning. Uh, the only time on the beach was empty. This is a rapidly growing resort. Um, and as uh, the day goes on, the birds are competing with hundreds, sometimes a thousand, scantily clad bathers, <laughs> loud music, ATVs racing down the beach, dogs as they're trying to eat the mussels that are exposed for a few hours by the tide. Now, into this chaos is Patricia Gonzalez. Um, she is calling on an entire generation of kids to care about life at the sea edge. I met scores of them coming from hundreds of miles and went much further away from the sea than we are here, who are earning money in an economy where there's no money to be earned, giving up time to come track birds in the blistering sun with her. And I talked to the kids living in uh, San Antonio West Bay, right nearby, who um, were the, the winners of the local beauty pageant. Now, in the past, uh, the winners of this beauty pageant all wanted to marry movie stars so they could live lives of glamour. And now, they still want to live lives of glamour. And, but to them, glamour is being a marine biologist or a park ranger when your salary is this is a profound change in attitude. And she, Patricia, is a marvelous, extraordinary teacher. And this is how she begins, with this gorgeous sign out on the mud flats, we are all shorebirds. She invites us to consider how the health of shorebirds is intertwined with ours. How what's at stake for them is also at stake for us. Not always an easy concept here, actually. Um, and I explore this idea of death in the book because I have to when we're on the brink of losing birth that nobody knows anything about. And I'm not actually going to be reading to you very much tonight. I'm just going to read a couple of passages if you want to read the book. You can read the book. I thought this was, it would be more fun to actually be able to show you these photographs. But this is what I said about that. Flying from one home to the next along their migration, red knots carry an imprint of each. The quality of their lives in one place enhanced or diminished by their lives in another. At the end of their journey, they have taken the measure of a shoreline running the length of the earth. And today, that shoreline is wanting. And the problem, in some ways, is actually quite simple. The birds need sustenance and safe harbor along the way. And here's what I mean. This is a skinny red knot. It's November. It's Argentina. The bird has just arrived. And it's hungry. And over the next uh, four or five months, it's going to double its weight. So that by February, it looks like this. <laughs> now, the reason for that would be this. You don't need to look at this map in a lot of detail. Um, it's the map of one bird uh, flying migration was tracked the data water. And what I just wanted you to look at here is that this bird flew 3,000 miles south in eight days. And then coming back, it flew 5,000 miles north in six days. And these were all non-stop flights. So if you don't like to think about numbers, it's going from Brazil or the white border up to the outer bay of North Carolina from northern Brazil to Delaware Bay without stopping. Now, aside from the substantial physiological changes required to undergo these long migrations and the enormous physical stamina required, um, which
which scientists study extensively, um, the mis there's mystery that remains. How do they know where they're going? Are they navigating by our magnetic field? Are they navigating by the stars? We don't know this. But we do know that they have a phenomenal sense of weather systems, that they can understand weather systems as they move across entire ocean basins. And the way one researcher described it, he said, shorebirds always know where they are relative to where they are from. And then he looked at me and he said, and the same question, of course, might be asked. And he uh, declined to answer it. And um, I'm not going to answer it either, um, except to say that as the narrow edge went to press, the roof of Red Knot, we track this on this map, and actually comes from a data logger that Larry Niles put on the bird. Funded. Um, this bird was listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act and is the first U.S. bird listed whose existence is imperiled by global warming and it by no means will be the last. Um, now, I accompany these birds many places, including places that uh, are not on this map. The, this is one route taken by one bird, but I went a lot of other places. I went to the um, Padre Island National Seashore and the Luna Madre in Texas, where um, in a very small plane, uh, garishly painted, I think that's the only word to describe it, to look like a Texas flag, we flew over the beach and the Laguna, zeroing on knots that were carrying radio tags. Each time, edging closer and closer to the Rio Grande and the Mexican border, um, testing trying to figure out a polite way of putting this, testing the forbearance of the uh, Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> we really did not like how close we were to the, to the border. But the thing was, this scientist, David Newstead, was tracking birds whose homes know no political boundaries. He was finding a previously undocumented place where they still find shelter, and then later, a long forgotten route, they still take north through the center of the country. And while I was getting uh, nauseous in this plane, we saw these beautiful birds. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to show them to you, not just because the photographs are so beautiful, but because this is one of the most heavily redesigned land landscapes that I've ever seen. And in this landscape, restoration is possible. And I think that is really I also went here. This is the uh, mouth of the Altamaha River in Georgia, where the islands and sandbars are undeveloped. The Upland River is protected and undammed, so that sand coming down the river is reshaping the islands and shoals, enabling them to migrate as the water rises. So the beaches that I went on are actually getting wider because the gains are far exceeding the losses. So these birds are going to have a critical home here in the years ahead. The uh, Georgia coast is going to become increasingly important for these birds. Oh, I also went here uh, to many alligator and snake infested swamps in South Carolina. And you can see, you can't even see the ocean here. These are, this is from an old rice plantation a bit inland. Um, this is also going to be an increasingly critical refuge for shorebirds. Um, these rice plantations um, have been purchased by hunters. The water levels are managed for ducks. And there has been billion dollars conserving 5 million acres from the sale of duck stamps. If you guys haven't purchased a duck stamp, you should go do it immediately. Um, and $7 billion through the sales of guns and ammunition. Um, hunters are the friends of birds. And I spoke to many of them, the ducks unlimited, who are actually willing to start reconsidering how these Rice plantations are managed because in, in South Carolina the water is rising.
is eroding and many, many shorebirds are coming in to these impoundments now. However, the largest concentration of red knots along the Atlantic in the spring is here in Delaware Bay. This is the easiest place for you to see them if you haven't. Um, it's a place, interestingly enough, that no one, including Roger Corey Peterson and David Sibley, none of the big birders, um, other than the locals, knew about this place until the 1970s. And that also says a lot to me about the kinds of things that lie in before us in plain sight. Now, the birds are here because of this. They're eating the pin-sized eggs of the horseshoe crab. Now, there are large numbers of horseshoe crabs in South Carolina and Georgia, but the greatest concentration left in the world is here in Delaware Bay. And I wanted to show you this slide because I wanted to suggest to you that this is a picture of scarcity and not abundance. There used to be millions and millions of horseshoe crabs in Delaware Bay. Now, as I said before, this is one of Earth's oldest animals. There are very few animals on this planet guys evolved. And you can kind of understand the, uh, their, the scale of this longevity if you collapse the history of the Earth into one year. If you do that, the horseshoe crab would arrive around the spring equinox. The first bird would evolve in the fall. And we would stroll in a few minutes before midnight on December 31st as the year closed out. Now to me, uh, this raises a profound ethical question of who we are, such late arrivals on this planet, to be saying who comes and who must go. Um, I am also painfully aware that there are a lot of people who do not share my ethical sensibilities. In this case, though, the blue blood of the horseshoe crab is essential to our health constitutes the only test approved by the FDA to set certain kinds of deleterious bacterial contamination, um, endotoxin, in our drugs and medical devices. And since there are probably very few people in this room who have experienced an endotoxin infection, I'm going to read um, Lewis Thomas's description of one from the lives of the cell. The body, he says, treats endotoxin as, quote, the very worst of very bad news. Sensing it, he says, we are likely to turn on every defense at our disposal. We will, and these are his words, they're not mine, we will bomb, defoliate, blockade, seal off, and destroy all the tissues in the area. The result is a shambles. The consequences, including fever and inflammation, low blood pressure, respiratory distress, suffocation, shock, and sometimes death. Now I imagine that everyone in this room has been vaccinated, has had his or her child vaccinated, has had or knows someone who's had an IV line, either for rehydration therapy, antibiotics, chemotherapy, has had hip or knee replacements, PET scans, radioactive tracers, and you haven't died of an endotoxin infection. And that's because your life has been touched and made better by the exquisite sensitivity of the blue blood of a horseshoe crab. Mm -hmm. Horseshoe crabs also anchor an entire web of life on the sea, with, uh, on the sea edge, which I'm not going to go into now. There are a lot of animals that depend on this old guy here. Um, but I am going to give you a few numbers. <coughs> so here are some horseshoe crab eggs. Each horseshoe crab, lay, each horseshoe crab lays about 80,000 eggs each knot needs 400,000 eggs to double its weight, and 40,000 knots, which is um, not anywhere near the population we're shooting for, um, need 16 billion eggs. Now, these eggs, which you see here in a rather thin coating, um, used to be so thick in the Delaware Bay that you could take them away by the way. And not that long ago, uh, Pete Myers in the 1980s used to walk to places in Delaware Bay where they were up to his knees. And this is what I kind of said about that. As we feel the passage of time, day to day, month to month, and year to year, we may not see the gradual accumulation of loss, 
your feeling urgency as we accept this still beautiful but greatly diminished world we come into, knowing no other and not realizing or asking what that world was or could be. Instead, we argue over the scraps that remain. And this is why as we begin to decide how to restore the homes of these birds and horse craft, this history is so important. So what about this history in New York? Um, this June on Plum Beach in the Jamaica Bay National Wildlife Refuge, a lot of people went out to look at horseshoe crabs on the moonlit nights in June. And on a really good night, they saw 200, maybe 300 horseshoe crabs. In 1878, in the mouth of the Potomac River, one man captured 19,000 This is why when knots used to come through here in the thousands, they're not doing that anymore. They're just darn enough eggs for them. So what happened? In Delaware Bay and in New England, including Massachusetts where I live, we took too many horseshoe crabs for bait and deprived the birds of sustenance. Um, they were taken in 1878 to fatten up eels, and they're still used to catch eels. In New England and in New York, this take is unsustainable, and even the regulators have finally acknowledged that. Um, in Delaware Bay, uh, thanks to Larry Niles, um, the decline has been stanched, but the population has not been rebuilt after 15 years of regulation. We really have a problem here. Now, losing these birds, from my perspective, is unconscionable and unnecessary. There's great alternative bait, which we can talk about as well later if you want to. And horseshoe crabs and shorebirds are strong and they're resilient. We just need to give them a little breathing. So here's a getting fat red knot in Delaware Bay. Now the one that I showed you before in Argentina had a few months to double its weight. This bird is going to double its weight in 10 days. Now that to me is an example of tough. And the reason it needs to do that is because it's going here. This is a piece of gravel in East Bay, Southampton Island, just south of the Arctic Circle. Um, as you can see, uh, there's no radar, there's no lights, there's no room for error here. There's water and snow on both sides of this ridge. And um, it is a clear day, but it was, I think, one of the only clear days we had up there. And the bush pilot dropped us off after a blinding snowstorm and grounded us for days on that and I left. And I was stuck there for five days, but the Seabird team had been there for two weeks, and they all got to see Snow White at least twice. And the pilots uh, could not distinguish the snow on the ground from the clouds in the sky, and so they, they couldn't fly. And the thing about this is that when we finally got there, uh, we got out, we were looking around, and um, we found a red knot, and it had a flag on it. And I immediately squandered my five minutes of satellite time a week. Uh, and I called Larry and I said, here's the number, what about this bird? And he called me back and he said that um, that bird was still in Delaware Bay long after I had left to try to get up there with all my equipment. And um, so it was flying through that Northeaster, formed only by its fat and feathers, and guided by we don't know what. But there it was in East Bay. Now, East Bay, like the Strait of Magellan, is a very difficult place. Um, and I'm just going to try to give you a small sense of that quickly. Um, while the birds were outside in the snow, uh, we were here in what one magazine that did not consult with me about the uh, captions they were writing for my photographs put in um, quotes that this was our deluxe quarters. And they were being sarcastic. And the thing is, I thought it was deluxe. And this is why you can see this cabin where we were living. Um, the windows are very narrow. And the reason the windows are specifically designed to be narrow is that if a polar bear tries to get in at night, it's obviously going to get in. These are large, angry animals. But the window was uh, fit narrow enough so that we would wake up and be able to deal with it. And I actually thought that was deluxe. <laughs> now, uh, 
I want to show <coughs> people the next generation of stewards of our earth. This is Meg McCluskey, and what I wanted to point out to you about her is she's on the shorter research team up there. She's, uh, she's very happy. I don't think anybody would dispute that. And she's quite cold. She's wearing <laughs> everything she owns. And, um, but she loves it up there. Despite this, it is a very stark place. And if you look at the place names of all the bodies of water around East Bay, South Carolina, you find these amazing names. You find Repulse Bay. You find the Bay of God's Mercy. These were the names that were given up here by the North, the, the uh, Europeans looking for the Northwest Passage, and the names have not changed because it's still very difficult up there. Now this is the more recently named, but also aptly named, Inconvenience Lake, which you can see us crawling across. Um, we're crawling because otherwise we would sink in the snow, and if you've ever been up to your thighs in melting snow, you know it's kind of a problem. We would crawl across this lake, and then we would spend eight to 10 miles every day looking for shorebird nests. And, um, I don't know. This is uh, an Inuit street sign and a nookshook. Um, you can have all the fancy equipment in the world, but after eight hours out in the cold, it fails. And that's fine, except when the thaw comes in and you can't see where you are, we were very grateful for this. These are the 12-gauge uh, shotguns we kept with us all the time. The extra slug is on the table. And the reason for that is this. <laughs> and also, like, I don't know, five years ago, you would never have seen this up on the ridge where we were. Um, and now it's actually getting to be quite dangerous up there. The reason for that is this. The melting ice is changing the face of the Arctic. Um, still, though, it's a very short season. Um, spring does finally come. So there it is. It's not the riot of, of you know, flowers you see here, but it's, this is the Saxon tragedy. It's very beautiful. And then the, uh, the atmosphere is filled with singing birds. So I just wanted to show you a few of them. These are like the terns, king niters. People come down to Gloucester to see the king niter 200 feet away, and these were just nesting right outside our cabin. Blooms. Balrops sitting in every pool. Um, this is the ready turn stone. I just wanted you to look at this bird. Its numbers are tanking just as much as the knots are. So the knot is really a bellwether now for many other birds. So here's the knot on its nest. Here are the eggs. Now, not all the eggs hatch. There's this guy, obviously sleeping off a big meal. Um, but these eggs did hatch. Um, and before I talk about the chicks, I just wanted to point out that a little catkin up there is on a willow tree. The willow doesn't grow any taller than that. Um, now, once these eggs have hatched, um, what happens next to me is a real testament to the resilience of these fluffy little birds. The mother becomes, as the scientists uh, try without any value judgment, it, disinterested. <laughs> that is, she takes off and leaves. And the birds begin foraging as soon as their feathers dry, they're feeding themselves. The eggs are hatching in about 24 to 36 hours, and the father is hanging around. And what he's going to do is he's going to walk them down to the beach, maybe a mile, maybe two miles. And he'll be warning them of predators and covering them as it gets really cold. But that's what he, he does. And as soon as they get to the water, he's gone. So, and they don't even know how to fly yet. So the birds are coming south, and once the nesting season is over, which it is now, they're coming south in waves. And the mothers, the fathers, and then the babies. And they're going across another indecipherable landscape. This is the Canadian muskeg. They stop in James Bay to uh, stock up on clams. And um, I love being in James Bay, but I, not, I would suggest all of you go to Delaware Bay instead. This has five, I want to make sure I get this right, five million mosquitoes per acre. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty grim up there. And 
and we had to walk by these guys every morning. Um, but they were just eating strawberries, so after the polar bears, I wasn't too worried about it. So here's the marsh. This could be anywhere along the flyway. We're just out to the edge. The birds are passing through in September and October. And actually, this year, they're coming through now. Um, and as um, all the work that's being done at Cary and in the other groups on the Scenic Hudson and the Satanic Valley Association are able to restore this river, uh, we don't know what might be possible here. I went through all of the eBird stuff. There's plenty of shorebirds that come through here. And then somebody from uh, sent me this great record from, um, I may pronounce it wrong, Halcyon Lake mm -hmm. in Pine Plains. It's about 20 minutes away, it seems, on my map. Um, a baby bird came through here on August 21st, the baby red knot in 1921. <laughs> so it's been done before. Um, who knows what the history is here. Now, uh, The Narrow Edge, as I said, is a book about grievous loss. But as I went along this highway and I watched how, how hard everybody was working and I saw the resilience of these animals, um, to me it really is a book about tenacity, it's a book about endurance, it's a book about how loss can turn toward restoration, and it's a book about compassion. And this was evoked in many ways, so I'm just going to give you one example and read something, and then I'll take your questions. On um, my return home one year after what well, for these birds was yet another gruesomely hard summer up in the Arctic. And on a warm afternoon in September, we paddled out on the marsh behind my house to a, uh, a sandbar. And we beached our kayaks and waited and waited and waited as the tide was coming in. And you never know what you're going to see out there. Um, after a couple of hours, as the tide was pushing all the birds against the grass, um, we saw three juvenile red knots in the marsh behind my house. And their plumage was so fresh shining in the sun. And they were heading south on this route that they had never traveled to this place that they had never been, having come so many miles with so many thousands more to go. And I just looked at that and I thought, they can do this, we can do anything. So I'm going to just end with one passage from the book and then I'll take your questions. Red knots speak to us of distant realms uniting us along the line that stretches along the entire edge of continents. Their long flights through an immensity of sky that reaches from one end of the earth to the other embody our own longings and dreams. As we lose our bearings, their flights offer a compass. In the tenacity of horseshoe crabs appearing on a moonlit beach, and in the resilience of shorebirds, a flock of knots lifting into the evening sky at Bialomas, their gentle voices singing in the Arctic stillness, or a lone bird flying through a hurricane. I find hope that we can face the challenges that lie before us, and in the possibility that our children will inherit an earth, where wildlife will still have a home at the edge of the sea. Their home is ours. We stand together, all of us, on this narrow edge, in a time fraught with challenge, but still filled with promise.
here in the beach has been phenomenally successful. And so space is being given to these birds and the numbers are increasing pretty much every year. And um, one of these days it's going to get downgraded. So these birds, the knots nest up in the Arctic. They don't nest anywhere along the supply line. Okay, thank you. Yes? Uh, this is a little I do. They work in the marshes and the sandbar. Okay, it has a house in Rockport and pretty familiar with the shore. Is there any places in Rockport around there in the little cove? Uh, to see them? Yeah. The question is, um, the um, woman asking the question uh, has a home in Rockport and wanted to know if you could see the birds there. I have uh, one photograph of a another young red knot from the Halibut Point State Park. Do you know where that is? Right. There's a big um, slag heap of granite that had been mined um, next to the quarry, and this bird showed up in January. Obviously, it was a little lost, and we're hoping <laughs> that it actually made it someplace a little bit warmer. But if you, the knots themselves are in Essex Bay, so that would be in the sandbars between the end of Winter Sheep Beach and the southern end of crates. That's the first time I've actually had a question about my own backyard. <laughs> yeah. When you talk about resilience, do they, are there other things that they eat that might be able to sustain them while pressure grass cover? I wish you hadn't asked me that question. The question is, are there anything, anything else that the birds can eat while the horseshoe grass recover? And, um, I would say no, and I would say that for a couple of reasons. When the, when the horseshoe crab numbers were at their very lowest, um, well, wait, let me backtrack. Normally, um, when there are plenty of horseshoe crabs, the, in Delaware Bay, 80% of the birds gain the weight that they need to make it up to the Arctic. So when the crabs were depleted, 30% of the birds were taken the way they need. So, no. Now, the thing that's um, upsetting about all this is that they're eating all these horseshoe crab eggs in, in Delaware Bay, but I'm, I mean, I know now, after doing all this research, they were eating horseshoe crab eggs everywhere. They were eating them in Massachusetts, they were eating them in Georgia, they were eating them in South Carolina, they were eating them in Long Island, Texas. Sound. Because that is their preferred um, food because these little eggs, they're all lipid, so the, the rate of conversion to fat is, and energy is just huge. And so what they're eating when they can't get the horseshoe crab eggs are these tiny mussels and clams, which there's a lot of ballast there. The shell isn't really very useful. And um, uh, this is why I show the picture of Carmen. I am really trying hard to um, and I did this in the article I wrote for Audubon, make it clear that she needs research money to look at ocean acidification down there. Because where I live, we have tons of economic studies showing what's going to happen to our scallop industry and our mussel industry um, as the water becomes more acidic and nobody's looking at what's happening to the birds. And that's the second, that we can't really lose two of them. So that's the great answer to that. Yes. And going back to your neighborhood, is this Bill Sargent still the neighborhood? Yes. Um, and he asked if I knew Bill Sargent. Um, Bill, um, I live between this woman, Rockport, he lives in Ipswich. Um, and he's written a number of books about horseshoe crabs, um, particularly about the biomedical industry. And yes, uh, I do know him and I see him. Yeah. to be 
in order to make sure that there's enough eggs for the birds. Because eating the eggs, I guess I should just say, doesn't hurt the orchard crab population. These eggs, the eggs that the birds eat are all eggs that are exhumed by multiple orchard crabs coming ashore. Um, what has to happen is the bait industry needs, I mean, I guess what I would say is that we need to have a coastwide ban on the bait industry. And um, the, all the organizations that I just mentioned, including also the American Literal Society, have been pushing the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission to tighten up the regulations, to not allow 600,000 horse crabs to be taken every year. Now they consider that adequate regulation before they didn't have any limit on it. I hope I'm trying to convey to you that I guess I've had a lot of experience with regulatory agencies that are dominated by people who have economic interests in making sure that, that the resource isn't regulated. And um, the flip side of this is that in South Carolina, when the biomedical industry came into South Carolina, the man who started it there very astutely decided that he did not want to be competing with bait fishermen. Because now there's a lot of attention being focused on the biomedical industry also, which has its share of improvements to make. Um, but what he did was he, he went to the South Carolina legislature and he said, it's, we have to ban the bait industry. And so there's no, there's no bait industry in South Carolina, and the worship crabs are fine. And they're able to sustain the 30% the mortality rate that occurs in the biomedical industry. But you can't have a huge, you can't have, you can't have a 30% mortality rate in the biomedical industry because the biomedical industry is skyrocketing, combined with a 100% mortality rate in the bait industry, and, and you have enough worship grass. It's, the math is, I mean, the numbers give you a migraine if you try to go through them all, but it's actually pretty straightforward. And, you know, we need 3,000 people to go down to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and say, excuse me, we're watching you. Uh, yes, it is. It's too high, and that could be altered. That's a whole other conversation. No. Yes. No. Um, I, I didn't, I wanted to make sure I kept within the, the time constraints, so I didn't talk about that. The question was, are the red knots the only birds that eat horseshoe crab eggs? There's 20 species of shorebirds that eat horseshoe crabs, plus there's other birds like um, uh, rosy terns that eat sand shrimp, and 50% of the diet of the sand shrimp in Massachusetts is horseshoe crab eggs. So you can connect the horseshoe crab to these magnificent food webs all along the shore. So it's lots, it's lots. And then the horseshoe crab itself um, is eaten by water and sea turtles and sharks. Yes? Is there a lot of habitat loss along the shoreline due to development that's also affecting the horseshoe crab population? Um, the question is, is there a lot of loss along the shoreline that's affecting the horseshoe crab population? And, um, in some places, that's definitely true. So that um, in New Jersey, after Hurricane Sandy, 70% of the spawning beaches for the horseshoe crab were <coughs> severely damaged. Um, Larry was terrified that that was going to do in the red knot. And um, because, as I said before, there still aren't enough horseshoe crabs, and he was afraid that the ones that were there weren't going to be able to come in. So they spent, I, I, I don't have the exact number now, but I think it's at least $5 million of, of uh, Hurricane Sandy restoration money has gone into rebuilding those beaches in Delaware Bay. Those beaches have been rebuilt, but the horseshoe crab numbers still haven't. Still haven't gotten up, but horseshoe crab is, a, is, is it's an amazingly resilient animal. So I can go to Del I go over to Delaware Bay, but you go and, and the shoreline is eroding away, and there's houses on pilings, and the crabs are screaming.
scurrying up and they're squatting underneath the pilings and then the birds are coming in I mean uh, in the pilings beneath the porches and um, the Fish and Wildlife Service is very concerned that erosion is going to make things a lot worse but it's hard it's really hard to predict what those numbers are going to be because you look at New Jersey and you look at Delaware, there is a lot of land that has already been protected in Delaware Bay. And it's very flat there. So the whole uh, restoration idea there now, a lot of it is to make sure these salt marshes are resilient so that the whole business can migrate in one. Because um, where, where sand is lost, if there's if there's room in back, the beach can be rebuilt. So you, you see that. Um, I can't really remember. I saw that on a beach. I can't remember the name of the beach right now in, in Delaware Bay. It was a beach that erosion had wiped out all the houses. The, the town had been abandoned, I think, in the 1950s. All the rubble had been left on the beach, so the crabs didn't spawn. It was a mess. So Larry got all the rubble cleaned out, and um, he got sand brought in. And then there were a lot of storms, and the sand was taken off the beach, but it didn't go out to sea. It was brought into all the little tributaries. So you could see the beach rebuilding in the back, and you could see crabs spawning there. So there's room there. There isn't room in parts of South Carolina. Parts of South Carolina are very highly developed. So I, I, I know I'm giving you mush. I don't think we know exactly what's going to happen, and you have to look at it place by place. So yes, it's a problem, but we can't really quantify how big a problem it is. I mean, the rising sea is a, is a problem. Yes? So do the nuts always return to the same places along their route, or do you use uh, to preserve another place that is adequate habitat for a different the, the question is, do the knots always go back to the same place, or would they go to a new place if that was preserved? Um, I think that what uh, what I was able to learn from this, at going out with these biologists, one thing about these birds is that they have an uncanny knack to figure out where their richest supply of food is. So that is where they're going. So if the restored area has lots of horseshoe crabs or lots of clams, that's where they're going to go. And you can see that. Um, I saw that manifested in many places, but you can see that. It was a beautiful example of this um, that I saw. Once in South Carolina and once on Little St. Simons Island in, in Georgia. Um, we were on Kiowa in South Carolina, which is undergoing this massive development right now and um, the birds were there eating tiny clams that's what's on that beach and the, uh, the biologist um, had planned to do a big catch to tag the birds and put some data trackers on them and uh, she'd seen the birds there it was all set to do with the next day and they were gone and the reason was that night further south in the ace basin the horseshoe grass had started to and within an hour, they were there. And the same thing happened, I saw on, uh, on Little St. Simons. I went to Little St. Simons. They told me, no red dots, no worship mask. I thought I really screwed up the, uh, my trip there. And I, I said to Stacia, well, you know, I'm here. I'm just going to stick around a few days. I'll go birding. And then, and then I said, but I do want to go out. I'm going to go out at night and look for these worship crabs. And then, Went out one night, horseshoe crabs were there. The next morning, five o'clock, I went to the beach. There were a thousand, but not so many. <laughs> so, uh, is that the that's the real answer to, to the question? Where is the food? Yes. Yeah, you. Um, you. What you have? Uh, you showed us a map of one uh, red knot. Right. It's it, half. Yeah. And I'm wondering if if there is data about that particular red knot the next year? Um, or, uh, I, I, yeah, if it follows the same path. 
Yes. Um, that had a couple of uh, that had a couple of years on that map. There's something called um, bandedbird.org, and you go to Banded Bird, and you have to follow the. It's not the easiest website to use, but you can follow the instructions and figure it out. And once you get in there, you they allow for the species. You type in the species. You um, I think it would be under, I think it's under red knot, it could be under collegiate canoes, I can't remember. And then you type in the, um, the letters Y, zero, Y, and that's the, that was that map. And then it'll show you every place it's been seen. Really? Yeah. Y, zero, Y? Yeah. Okay. It's exciting, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, just out of curiosity, Um, it's blood is uh, taken 
to perform this test, which detects endotoxin contamination in all of our injectable drugs and implanted medical devices. We need this animal. That's a good way of ending. <laughs>